Hello, I'm Irene Haynes, and I'm going to be talking to you today about responsible, ethical, and fair authorship. Getting appropriate credit for the outputs of research is hugely important. Um, it determines job prospects, career advancement, grant funding. It also includes the authorship of research articles, and you are often hear these referred to as the currency of academia. So there's an awful lot at stake, and it's therefore not surprising that we see problems. Authorship issues are actually some of the most common problems that journal editors see. Um, and also, when you ask researchers, it's very rare to find a researcher who hasn't either experienced it themselves or knows of somebody who has. And when people are asked in surveys why there are these sorts of problems and so many of them, um, the most frequent answer that is given is pressure to publish. And it's a key issue and it also seems to be increasing. But it isn't actually a new issue. This is um, the book Cantor's Dilemma written by Carl Gerasi, who's, who's often called the father of the pill because he was involved in the development of it. And this is from um, the afterword that he's written. And I'm gonna read this to you because I think it's very important. Publications, priorities, the order of the authors, the choice of the journal, the collegiality and the brutal competition, academic tenure, grantsmanship, the Nobel, Pri Nobel Prize, Schadenfreude. These are the soul and baggage of contemporary science. And he gives an example of um, authorship gamesmanship. My Jean Ardley changed her name from Yardley to climb up the alphabetical ladder of authors. So did a scientific acquaintance of mine, jumping some 20 letters to move to the front by a stroke of a judge's pen. Now this book was actually written and published in 1989. So that's more than 30 years ago. But I think, and when I'm talking to people in a, in a live audience, people agree that this actually reflects what's happening today. And within the book, which is a really good read, so I can recommend that you go and read it. <clears throat> um, many of the issues, reproducibility, uh, authorship problems are in, are in there. Around about the same time, um, a book by Stephen Locke, who's editor, past editor of the BMJ came out. On, and it's a seminal book on peer review. And he, <clears throat> excuse me, he made, um, he's got a quote, again, which I think of very, very wise. And he said, um, and underlining these worries was yet another, that scientific articles have been hijacked away from their primary role of communicating scientific discovery to one of demonstrating academic activity. And again, in a live audience, many people would say, yes, that's what scientific publication, communicating scientific has become. It's not communicating, it's demonstrating academic activity. And I should just say, a lot of the examples that we have in ethics and integrity come from science because that's where they have predominantly occurred in the past. But all the issues have referred to every discipline. So often, like in this quote, it says scientific articles, but you can just substitute it with research or scholarly because it does, all these issues apply to every single discipline. Now, what are our early career researchers feeling in this kind of environment? Um, so this website called Bullied Into Bad Science, which is actually an early career research initiative, gives us some insight into this because it gives examples on the website. And if you look at this, uh, it's very worrying. Um, how do they feel? Pressured to publish in high impact journals. Harassed by supervisors to modify data to make papers look better for publication in prestigious journals. Coerced into conducting flawed research. Is this the way that we want our early career researchers to be trained for the, to feel like this? And if you go on that site, you'll see other examples. This is, as I said, very, very worrying. Now, I was in scholarly publishing for um, 20 years, the editor of a journal, and I was on the Committee on Publication Ethics for, on the council for three years. And I thought I'd seen everything, the good, the bad, the ugly, the very ugly. But when I read this paper, I was absolutely shocked. China's Publication Bazaar. And again, I recommend you go and look at it if you want to look at the sorts of things that are happening nowadays. This paper was the result of um, an undercover operation by the journal Science. Um, and quoting from reading the quote, it says, 
It uncovered a flourishing academic black market involving shady agencies, corrupt scientists, and compromised editors. There were papers for sale. We've known that for a long time. They actually had a catalog. There were data for sale. Now, this could be real data that they um, commissioned someone to produce, but if you didn't have that and you wanted data, they would provide fake data. That alone is worrying. Ghostwriters to write papers, authorship for sale. Again, we have known about this for a long time, but what really shocked me was that you could buy authorship at the provisional acceptance stage. Now that would mean that the paper had been through peer review, it was out maybe for uh, revision, for and during that period, um, people went out to tout for authorship and they followed these papers and they were eventually pub published. Now, these were some reputable journals involved in this. And part of the failure of the process was that they had not checked that authors have been added. But this is shocking. You know, can we trust the literature? Now, authorship, besides bringing reputational credit, can also bring, bring big rewards, a lot of cash. 50,000 US dollars, that is the amount that a researcher could get for publishing one paper in a high impact journal. Individual institutions given money. Again, the example, and this is from uh, Nature Editorial, which, which looked into the, the situation just a few years ago, 2 million US dollars given to an institution for one publication. And really, Concerning thing as well, it was given apparently awarding cash day after publication. So things can go wrong. Again, I'm giving you these examples just to give you an idea of the sorts of environment that we're trying to achieve responsible, ethical, and fair authorship. What kind of things are people doing to game the system effectively? Uh, Taylor and Francis did a survey on peer review in 2015 and they asked a question on peer review, and I'm going to read the um, actual question. It says, approximately on what proportion of papers that you have submitted to single blind peer review journals have you taken the following actions? And I picked out things that are connected to authorship. Now, switched the lead author with a co-author who is more senior in order to increase the likelihood of publication. And you can see the percentages. Science, technical, medical, medical. 23%, that's nearly a quarter. Humanities and social sciences, 10%. Again, this shows you that it's happening across disciplines. And when I saw this, I thought, well, what well, how did that original first author feel like? Were they put under pressure? Was it a junior author? This has real implications. Another gamesmanship thing. Switched my main institution affiliation to a secondary institution affiliation in a different region of the world in order to increase the likelihood of publication. Again, these are unethical things, but they are happening. And in my experience as an editor and at COPE, one of the most distressing things, especially for young people, is to be deprived of fair, appropriate authorship. Um, either to be deprived of it completely or to be moved in position. So this came up um, as a tweet and it actually expresses very clearly what is happening to some people. So this is a medical student. So I'm being told it is inappropriate for a medical student to be the first author on a paper and therefore the fellow, the PI needs to be first author. Is this true? Because this fellow has said I could be first author since January and I've put in over 200 hours of time in and done all the writing. And at the time I took this screenshot, there were over 300 responses with indicating that many people had also experienced this. And the answer to this is very simple. And you can see the tweet on the right from Michael Eisen, who is actually the new editor in chief of the journal eLife. Um, he's based in California. And how he expresses it is very blunt, but it actually is true. And I can't stress to you enough that whatever career stage you're at, if you have done something to warrant authorship, you deserve to be an author and you deserve to be in the appropriate position. School children have actually appeared on papers because they have done things which warrant authorship. So again, and I like to provide tools for people, especially early career researchers, to give them some power to be able to confront a situation or deal with a situation diplomatically that they feel they may have no power. 
because this is one of the big, big issues. There is this imbalance of power and young researchers particularly feel they don't have the power to be able to raise these issues. Um, another researcher raised a similar thing. The reason I've added this is that um, there are researchers who aren't working in universities and research institutions. This was someone from a museum, but they're still publishing, they're an author, but there isn't the mechanism for dealing with the kind of problems. So again, this is something that the, the research world has, has to address because the people there are struggling as well. So what qualifies someone for, for authorship? I mean, it's very general rule is all individuals named as authors should qualify for authorship and all those who do qualify should be listed. There should be no guests or ghosts. Now, a guest is someone who is added as an author, but they haven't done enough to warrant part, um, being an author or sometimes nothing at all. And there are various reasons that that happens. Or ghosts. Now, ghosts are people who have done an incredible amount, a lot, things, but they don't appear. Now, this happens um, or has happened in the past much more in things like um, in the pharmaceutical industry where there may be people writing the papers. And the issue is there has to be transparency because you also have to know what potential conflicts does this person have? So those two categories there um, generally accepted that should not, that shouldn't happen. Now, is general, authorship is generally based on substantial, you hear the expression, substantial intellectual contribution to the, to the work. And I'm gonna go on to, to um, talk about that in a moment. But there are two situations that absolutely do not warrant being an authorship. Getting funding or general supervision or administrative support alone don't justify authorship. Being head of department of an institute doesn't qualify for authorship either. Now, these do unfortunately still happen, not so much as they used to, but they do. And it is a real problem because um, it can cause enormous um, dis distress to people, um, unfairness. And in some areas of the world, it is still recognized that being a head of department or institution will get you your name on it, on a paper. There are authorship guidelines and you'll see anything from just very brief statements to things that are very prescriptive. One of the best known ones is, comes from the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, the ICMJE. Four criteria have to be met, um, used very commonly by journals outside of the, the medical field, but they are considered to be a little bit too rigid, limited, and they are open to abuse because you absolutely have to qualify according to those criteria. So people have started adapting them and looking at new ways with it to make them more broadly adopted. And I'd recommend you go and read this paper by McNutt et al, um, because they have produced um, a variation on this. And you'll notice here, it says that the actual writing is no longer a requirement. And this leads on to the question, is authorship an appropriate term anymore? And we'll be moving, I'll be talking about moving to a different concept, the concept of contributorship uh, later on. But why I think you should also go and read this paper is because it outlines uh, what is expected of corresponding authors. Now, a lot of people aren't aware of what this involves. And I have had senior people come to me and say, my junior person wants to be the corresponding author because they think it will be a step up in their career. Be very, very wary if this happens. Now the person does need to learn how to be a corresponding author. So you could, a senior person could do this with a junior person and it'd be part of a learning process. But there are great responsibilities involved of being a corresponding author, legal, ethical, whatever. And especially if you're dealing with a large group of authors. And this paper does actually, because it's quite rare to actually find what the responsibilities are. This, this paper does actually um, show you. So if you've got guidelines, they're useful, but actually, how do you put them into practice? Um, and I know from experience, because I've written to, to certain people when they produce them, and punctuation can actually make um, guidelines ambiguous. A single comma can completely change the meaning. And you have to have clarity, because sometimes in um, authorship disputes, which can go um, end up in legal as legal cases, Punctuation and ambiguity um, 
absolutely critical because someone could argue, well, I followed the guideline, but they haven't actually. That was not the intent of the guideline. A lot of researchers um, don't actually know what the normal practice is. And I'm talking to people across the career spectrum because things are changing quite rapidly in research integrity, ethical issues, and things like things like authorship, which is, which is obviously part of research integrity. And for, if you are a senior researcher, I would recommend that actually do not even assume the most basic knowledge for people could come into your groups. And nobody should ever be made to feel that they are asking a stupid question because they might think, oh, I'm coming into this big group. Everyone's, you know, a nice researcher, but I don't know this. And I'm talking about the most, most, most basic things. And again, I'm going to go on to sort of introduce um, a couple of things that might help in that kind of situation. But these guidelines are useful when you want to have discussions, but also when, um, if you're, you're a junior researcher and you do have a problem in, with your um, supervisor or someone else who's senior, more senior than you, that you can point to them and say, well, actually, and you can do this in a naive way because you're junior. And again, dealing with these issues involves a lot of diplomacy. You learn skills that will help you to achieve an outcome that is fair. Um, and you can point to these guidelines and say, well, this journal actually says this. So I would recommend actually looking at the guidelines if you are having problems. And it's not just credit that comes with authorship, responsibility, and the responsibility is quite serious because you are responsible for the integrity of the work. You're accountable for it, but also for resolving authorship disputes. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, authorship dis uh, issues, disputes, are one of the most common things that editors see. And a lot of these things do not come to light until the work is submitted for publication or published. And you ideally want to resolve issues before you get that, to that stage when it becomes public and everything becomes much, much more difficult. If a dispute arises, the manuscript, if it's with a journal, if it's in the review process, it will be put on hold until it is resolved. And the whole group um, the collaborators, if you're working with another group, everyone suffers and it can go to legal cases. And also it is not the editors or the journal's role to resolve the disputes. They will refer it back to the researchers and their institutions because those are the people who have access to the actual research work, lab books, um, papers might need to be looked into. So be very, very careful about this. Try and resolve issues early on. A couple of issues I'm going to mention, mention to you that can lead to problems. And the first one is that authorship conventions vary between disciplines and cultures. Um, for example, what does the order of authors mean? In the sciences, in the life sciences, for example, the first author is generally recognized as the younger person, the PhD student, the postdoc who's done most of the work. The final position is the supervisor. But in other disciplines, the order is alphabetical, you know? And if you're working in a collaborative collaboration, you get to the end and suddenly you've got to discuss authorship or you find that actually you've been put in a position if you've got a, left, a surname beginning with W where you're at the end of the list. So these are really, really serious issues but they can be resolved very easily. Um, and I'm just going to read to you this because um, again, I would recommend you, you look at um, the Montreal Statement on Research Integrity. This is a statement that's came out of the Third World Conference on Research Integrity. And the, conference, the World Conferences on Research Integrity produce guidelines. They happen every, um, I think it's three years. Um, yes, I may be wrong with that, but I think it's, it's three years. So they express this in a very, very good way. It's the statement on research integrity in cross boundary research collaborations. So that actually covers a lot of things. And it says research collaborations that cross Across national, institutional, disciplinary, uh, disciplinary and sector boundaries are important to the advancement of knowledge worldwide. But such collaborations present special challenges for the responsible conduct of research because they may involve substantial differences in regulatory and legal systems, organizational and funding structures, research cultures and approaches to training. Very, very important. This is a very simple guideline. It doesn't go on. You might have some guidelines go on for 20 pages and it's very difficult for people to absorb that kind of information or remember it. But this is a very short statement, but it summarizes things very concisely and precisely. And what it stresses throughout 
um, that all these things should be done at the outset and later as needed. You start talking about things very, very early on in a process, but then you revisit. And if you get into the habit of this, into this culture, in your research groups, in your institutes, in your departments, life becomes much easier because you can try and evolve the kind of disputes and problems and the distress and time that those bring. So again, in the authorship, there is an authorship statement again, and you, you might want to be able to refer to this at some time. The other big issue is that we have um, increasing numbers of authors on papers. Um, in science, it would be very, very rare now to find a single author paper. Um, it's still common, obviously, in the arts, humanities. Um, and now you can get thousands of people um, on a paper. And the record, when I put together this slide a few, few years ago, um, was held by a paper, <coughs> paper <coughs> Um, which had over 5,000, it was a Higgs boson paper, um, high energy um, particle physics, and it had over 5,000 people on it. Now, what did all those people do? This becomes a real issue when you have that number of people. But interestingly, that paper, the one um, with the, that held the record, it's always referred to as Ard et al, because the first author listed, they were listed alphabetically, and the first author is spelt A-A-D, so it's listed as Ard et al. But there were five, over 5,000 authors. So I mentioned before about the move from authorship to contributorship. What did everyone contribute to it? So there is transparency, and there is now a scheme um, launched in 2014 called Credit, Contributor Roles Taxonomy. It represents the roles that are typically um, used in scholarly outputs. There are 14 at the moment, and I'm gonna show you them in a, in a minute, but I know, I, well, I'm almost certain credit uh, are working towards making them broader and more applicable to, to, to more, more disciplines, but it's very much a pick and, pick and mix um, situation. So it just describes every one specific contribution um, and it is being widely adopted. This is what it looks like. Um, 14 categories and they're described. You can pick just some of them out. You won't have all 14 um, uh, linked to someone. That would be highly unusual. But it also allows things that hadn't previously been considered uh, to warrant authorship, like software development. Incredibly important issues. And you will see by reading the, uh, the slide. Um, they now can get credit for those. And this is something that's quite recent and which I actually like. It's um, using visualization tools to um, express authorship, contribution matrices. And this comes from, from, from this paper. And you can see there's quite a few um, authors and they have a bullet point by what they've been involved in. Again, very easy to, to see who's done what and how much. But I should say with all of these, it's like using credit, it's like using anything else. It, do, it depends on the honesty of the people um, involved, um, the fairness um, and people remembering what they've done, which is why I think it's important for everybody who, you know, whether you're a, a junior researcher, a senior researcher, keep your own list of contributions, what you have done. These kind of um, taxonomies will enable you to make it easy for yourself to actually um, tick off on whatever. And if you can get a sign off in that, again, in a diplomatic way within um, a research setting, because four years on, when you come to write a paper, who's gonna remember what you did, but you know, you will remember, and this will help you remember, but also to have proof and evidence that this is what I did at that time. You know, I weren't being authorship, uh, being an author. So I would recommend you do keep your own list. And also, this is from um, another paper from Simon Wiegott, and what he's introduced is also the levels of contribution, whether it's major support, um, major or support with different colors. So visually, it is very, very easy to sort of spot what has everyone done. And I'm just going to read you what he says, because he's in this article, um, Nate, there's an article in Nature, uh, Nature Index, and I recommend you go and read that because that outlines um, this new concept of author visualization, gives many more examples. And 
the quote um, from Simon we got is I think we should be much more precise in labeling what was contributed by whom. I started putting these tables in our manuscripts for that reason. He put these into the manuscript. Now, just because a journal or a book compilation or whatever it is you're submitting to um, doesn't state uh, we would like our authors to do this because the information for authors is sometimes impenetrable. It's very ad hoc at journals and they tell you more about formatting some journals than, than things that are really important. Other journals are actually superb. So, you know, there's a whole range there. But if you think this is a good way of doing things and the way you want to do things, insert it. Um, this, um, it'll often be... I think the examples I've seen, it's near the end of the paper um, before, before the references where the acknowledgements appear. Um, and just explain to the editor, because the editor may not be aware and they might think, ah, oh, this is a really good way of doing it, but it will be part of your paper. And along with the contribution, contributorship, it's very important that um, people now have what's called ORCID. Now, this is how it is, it is spelled. Now, this is much more common than when it started in um, 20, 2012, I think it was. It's a digital identity. It's a persistent identifier for researchers, scholars. Now, I've got one. I've had it um, since 2013, and I actually use it for everything. I've just used an example down here. This is a talk I gave at Glasgow University on a research integrity good practice day. I put it on my slide presentations. I had it at the beginning of, of this presentation and, and as a live link, which is important, you know, so people can click through. I use it in the footer um, of my email address because anyone I'm writing to, they can click through and it goes through and it will list all the things I've done, my professional information. So I recommend if you haven't got it, um, go and have a look and, and get one. <laughs> but I think a lot of institutions have already promoted this now. So it is much, much more common. Now, this slide is incredibly important. And um, I mentioned credit. Now, the credit taxonomy came out of a workshop in, in 2012 um, out in, at Harvard, sponsored by Harvard and the Wellcome Trust. And I was actually at that meeting and, and I wrote the report for this meeting. So this is a compilation of what two of the speakers said that they do within their research groups. And if everyone did this, I think we would reduce the authorship problems. There would be better relationships within groups, between groups, and it's very straightforward. First thing, have a clear authorship contributorship policy. If you're working within a group, when anyone joins it, you have, have it on paper saying, this is what we do within this group. It should evolve, it should evolve. And a new person coming in might actually say, well, we, had, we, did, we used to do this and it worked really well change your policy, revisit, revisit, discuss early on, revisit. Discuss and document individual contributor roles and professional authorship early on, ideally at the start of a project. Important, review contribution as work progresses, revise roles and authorship until manuscript submission. Because when some projects start, people assume, you know, you have a group of people who are there thinking they will be authors later on and they may not change. But as the work progresses, maybe new people are brought in, maybe some people step back. And so all those roles will change until the point comes that you're submitting the manuscript. And again, here, keep a descriptive authorship contribution list. And if you are a senior person, I would keep that as an ongoing thing. And I would also document the reasons, because if you have a junior person that you're dealing with and you're having to have that very difficult conversation where Really, it's somebody else who needs to be in a specific author position. If you can explain it to the person and get them to agree and understand why, um, or understand why an author who has, seems to have done very little is a main author, because that person might have had such insight, developed such um, input to the project that the project would, could not have developed without it, but it didn't take time. Time is not the key indicator of being an author. Um, and make sure all authors see and approve the final manuscript. A very simple list. And on that final point, anyone um, who is an author, you should always ask if it's not volunteered that you see and approve the final manuscripts. There's often a checkbox on manuscript submission systems where people have to check and say, you know, I have, everyone has seen it, the corresponding author will tick it. But that's not, I know from experience that not, that's not necessarily the true. 
Um, and if you're not happy with it, then ra raise that issue. This is another good way um, to introduce and deal with ethical issues. There's a blog called Dynamic Ecology, which is really good. And you don't have to be an ecologist to, 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 to get things from it. So in one session, one of the main bloggers thought instead of having discussing research papers in a journal club, that they would have an ethics discussion. And it worked really well. And you can see, he said, there was such a palpable hunger for talking about the subject that it made me very happy. We had taken the time and I plan to repeat this. So if you think your lab, you could say your group, your collaborators have no problems, especially if you think they have no, just do it. Go ahead and schedule a discussion of ethics in your lab. You'll be glad you did, and I certainly was. He explains there how he did it, and there are many ways you can do it, but why not do this? But also, if you are a junior person and you have an issue, what a good way for you to raise it within the group issue, group situation, without it being threatening. And actually authorship would be a fantastic topic for this. You could do it across disciplines. I mean, this can expand in many ways because it's very, very good. Having run workshops where I've had multi disciplines in, it is really productive to be able to have people in the same group who, comes from, who come from the arts, the sciences, the humanities, because you'll learn how different people do this and they will realize things are different. Um, so I heartily recommend that, that people do that. And you can actually say, well, I've been to a workshop, you know, I can get the papers together and everyone learns from that. Institutions, what can you do? Um, more senior people create awareness of the issues and the potential problems. Um, and we hear a lot about um, research culture and it's really, really important. And there are lots of initiatives and developments and that. But what you also want to do is you want to create a culture of ethical and responsible authorship. It's like a subdivision of the re research culture. Don't, when you're concentrating on the great big picture, forget about the minutia, which can, if you can sort out the smaller issues, the whole research culture will become a much healthier place. You have to educate people at all career stages. There will be senior people actually who um, may not want to attend certain workshops or whatever, but perhaps, you know, it, it, it can help them, but they need to be done in, in the right way. Also at institutions, you have got to have procedures in place for referrals of authorship disputes. And I know that some institutions struggle with this because you're getting a referral from um, a journal, the manuscripts on hold, or a note of concern is added to a published paper and you have to resolve it. And if you haven't got procedures in place or people who are experienced in this, it's gonna take time, distress. You don't have time for those sorts of things. Encourage the adoption and use of ORCID and introduction of credit and encourage early discussions in research groups and between collaborators, you know, facilitate these. Because we now have scientists working with artists, um, really important, dynamic, creative um, projects that are, that are going on. You need to get those sorts of people together. And it doesn't make, take much time and effort. Now, authors, <laughs> check your manuscripts carefully. I cannot stress this enough, both as an editor, an editor for 20 years, for the things that shouldn't be in them. And you should be checking this at every single stage before submission, after revision, at proof stage, and including any supporting materials. And I'm gonna give you two, two examples of where things, where people didn't check them carefully enough. So in this paper, an, um, a correction note appeared, um, which I've up here. Original version published on 12th of July 2014 has been replaced due to inclusion of an author's note not intended for publication. Now, that note wasn't actually noted for some time, but of course, when this appeared and people started noticing, the whole thing went viral. And as you can see from the altmetric uh, score, it's over 5,000 when I took this screenshot uh, a few, few years ago. Um, it might be a, a paper that warrants that. I'm, I can't comment on that, but I very much suspect that it's because it went viral. And the note that had been left was in uh, the paper, the authors had, one author had written to another, should we cite the crappy Gabor paper here? Now, you have to have a system for notes and taking them out. Can you imagine this? Uh, um, 
the relationship problems between the, the various groups again. The second um, example is much more serious. Now, this was a paper in 2013 and the principal investigator, the main or um, the group leader, left a note in the supporting information to the first author and it was published. And it was, please insert NMR data here. Where are they? And for this compound, just make up an elemental analysis. Now there's two ways you can interpret that last one. One is, yes, someone is asking someone to do something fraudulent, to fabricate it, or it could be just get together. The PI, the first, their first language, not, not English. So I think either of those two interpretations are totally open, but it went viral and everyone leapt to the first conclusion that there'd been fabrication. Enormously distressing situation where the people involved, um, it was very public and took a lot of time and there was an editorial review and there were a lot of corrections, but the editorial review uh, showed there was no evidence in any of the materials received that indicated falsified analyses. Simple thing, took masses of time, people left, left science, um, you know, so please, please, please check everything carefully. I just want to finish on these two word clouds. Um, the Wellcome Trust produced a report um, January last year, what research think, research, researchers think about the culture they work in. So the first word cloud is words that researchers would use to describe research culture. That's the current situation. Insecure, competitive, pressured. Very, very negative. Words that researchers would use to describe an ideal research culture, secure, supportive, creative, total difference. We want to be aiming for this and we want researchers to use their creative skills um, in pos positive ways. Because also when people see things happening um, and when they've done surveys, when they ask people, you know, have you ever in, had done questionable research practices, fraud, whole spectrum of things and when they ask them have they seen it happen many 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 more have seen it happen than the mit met to it um, so we want people to to work in a healthy environment so that they feel they continue working in a healthy way not in a way that makes them out of character because they feel sometimes they have no choice and my last slide is just the takeaway point from, from, from the whole talk really. And I would just say, make authorship an ongoing dialogue from the start of a project until publication. Make it open. Thank you. Great. I really thank you very much for the presentation and my apologies for the technical issues that we had at the beginning of our talk. Unfortunately, our normal screen sharing functions didn't work, so I had to do an alternative. Okay, we have run slightly over time because those uh, technical issues. We do have some time for a few questions, which I'll take my read off because she's unable to hear today. And the most recent question, uh, a colleague said, I hear how credit helps define contributorship amongst ethical authors, but I do not see how this also the more predatory behaviors such as ghost, guest or purchased authorship. If you're willing to lie about authorship, there's no barrier to misrepresenting contributorship. And that is a very good point. No system is proof against individuals acting malignly trying to distort things. An advantage of contributorship is it's normally easier to evidence in that a less well-defined authorship contribution is easy to fake and easy to challenge. With contributorship, uh, the authorship contributions are more defined. So it's a bit easier to produce evidence to say, no, I really did do this stuff. Also, I think the nature of the, that particular authorship, although it's not perfect, does encourage people to think more deeply about authorship because, again, it's a less diffuse category. It's OK, it's who did what, rather than an overall contribution. So again, it's easy to classify. I think it strengthens the system. You're absolutely right. It's not a panacea. It's a really good question. And any system, can, people can always try and play games with it or engage in outright falsehoods. However, I think it's a step in the right direction. But equally, if you have problems with it, as Irene said in her talk, do reach out for advice. Don't go through it alone. 
And also a question from another one on Stendi, questions about the disappearance in some disciplines of soul authored research and the impressions that soul authored research can be regarded as inferior. I don't think it's inferior. And I do think that in terms of initiatives to support good research practice, there is a slight bias towards those taking place more often in STEM disciplines uh, where and in disciplines where collaborative research is more common. So a lot of discussions about authorship are now more heavily focused towards collaborative authorship. Also because problems seem to be more common in collaborative authorship in the sense that if you have a team you're going to get disagreements or at least discussion about roles and responsibilities and authorship whereas if it's a sole author project you know who the author is it's you so i think i'm not surprised that people may think that there are less resources and less discussion around sole authored projects also because sole authored projects often the outputs are sometimes in journals, but sometimes they could be books, manuscripts, or they could be a thing, especially in the creative arts, you have a sole author research project and the output is an artwork or the like. So I think they often don't feature in the discussions as often as they should do. And with relevance to research that's more practice-based, our next webinar in February will be covering this topic. So I think sole authored research has a strong pedigree in many academic disciplines and it's great. Equally, collaborative research can be just as useful. Okay, I'm afraid we can't take any more questions due to time issues, and my apologies that the technical issues earlier have caused that. But again, we will go through all the Q&A text and see how we can respond to people who've asked those questions. So